Lecture 17 Shamans and Vegetation Gods In our last four lectures, we did a kind of biography of the goddess. In this one and the next two, we're going to do something of the same for God, accounting for some of the ways in which our apprehension of who God or the gods is or are has changed over, changed over time. The biography of God and the biography of the goddess are, of course, related, so that we'll try to interleave these, these in these lectures, interleave what we're doing with what we did in the last four lectures to see how the one affects the other. We'll do this for the next couple of lectures, and then we'll try to put all this together into a description of a single pantheon. We started with a pantheon, we'll end with a pantheon. This, a very complicated one the, um, from the mythology of India. The structure for this in the next two lectures is coming pretty much from a really great book on the biography of God by David Leeming and Jake Page called God, Myths of the Male Divine. Leeming and Page start their account of God with cave paintings that date back from about 30,000 BCE to about 10,000 BCE. The drawings are still in caves, and that they are in caves suggests that we're still in the world of the goddess. As we suggested, caves decorated with vulvas and deltas, and the caves themselves were probably female symbols sacred to the goddess. But on the walls and ceilings of these caves, there are some male figures, sometimes ithophallic, that is with enlarged genitalia, um, frequently wearing bird or animal masks and quite frequently bearded. We can't, of course, we've said this before, we can't really recreate what these meant for the people who drew them because we have no written records for contextualization. But we can guess, we can make some guesses based in part on the study of hunter-gatherer societies from Africa and North America that actually survived into the 19th century. One of the most important and controversial um, cave paintings, uh, dates from about 14,000 BCE, is in the cave of Les Trois Frères in the French Pyrenees. The figure on the ceiling combines human and animal features. The head is antlered, the face is bearded, the legs are human, but the torso is in an animal position that is parallel to the ground, and the genitals protrude, protrude out from behind in an animal way underneath a very bushy tail. The figure has been called the sorcerer, but that's our name for him. We have no idea what his own name might have been in his own time. Leeming and Page say that this looks to them like a picture of an early shaman or maybe the picture of an early animal master. And they think that the shaman may have been one of the earliest pictures of God that we have. We've mentioned shamanism before. Um, but now it's perhaps time to define more precisely what we mean by a shaman. The definition I'm going to give you comes from H.R. Ellis Davidson, um, a book called Gods and Myths of the Viking Age, and she says this about the shaman. The shaman's main function is to act as a kind of priest or witch doctor, though neither term is wholly satisfactory, and to offer himself as a link between the human community to which he belongs and the other world. While in a state of trance, he is believed to journey in spirit to the furthest heaven or to the land of the dead, so that he may visit the gods, or to obtain knowledge, or rescue some soul which disease or madness has expelled from its body. He acts as a seer, sometimes foretelling the future, finding the reason for calamities and disease, and answering questions concerning the destinies of those who consult him. That is, according to this definition, a shaman possesses magical powers, which are very useful but can also be dangerous. Um, his original role in Paleolithic period, when uh, humans depended on hunting for survival, was probably to assure a productive hunt. He would become an animal master. He would dress in the animal costume. He would relate himself to the animals his people are stalking. And his job would be to convince animals to give themselves up willingly to those who kill them. The hunt then becomes more ritual than murder, and the animal gives itself because if certain rituals are performed, the animal isn't terminally killed, it's born again so that the ritual can then repeat itself. To illustrate this, uh, Leeming and Page have this really interesting story. Uh, this is a Cherokee story about a man who goes to hunt bear in the mountains. 
he finds this huge bear and he shoots arrow after arrow after arrow into the bear without any effect at all. The bear, in fact, finally take, pulls all of the arrows out and simply hands them back to the hunter and explains, you're not going to be able to kill me anyway, so don't waste any more arrows. The man by this time recognizes that he is dealing with a medicine bear, that is, a, me a bear protected by a very powerful magic, and he gives over all efforts to kill it. The bear then invites the man to go with him, and he takes him first to a kind of bear council, and then he takes him to his home where the man spends the winter with the bear. The bear turns out to be a magic in a lot of ways. One of the, way, the ways it produces food, it just rubs its belly and food magically appears. The man stays with the bear for the entire winter, learning the ways of bears. While he's there for the winter, he also grows a long shaggy coat, something like that that the bear has himself. In the spring, the bear tells the man that he will be killed, but he also tells the man exactly what to do when the bear is killed to guarantee that this bear will not be dead forever, but will be reborn. Um, and it all happens the way the bear anticipates, and when the bear is killed, the man performs the rituals, and then the bear has told him, when you leave this place, look behind you, and when he looks behind him, he sees the bear rising up on his hind legs, dropping down to all four, and then disappearing into the forest. The story is probably, or at least possibly, the story of a young man's initiation into the mysteries of shamanism, especially about the relationship between man and animal. The mysteries are embodied in this story in the great bear who can read the hunter's mind and who can magically provide food. So the bear is in a way a kind of animal god or master shaman. The hunter is an apprentice shaman who takes the mysteries he's learned back to his people. In the future, he will wear that fur that was grown during the time with the bear, and he will teach his people the rights to perform over the killed bear so that it can be reborn to be killed again. Uh, Leeming and Page see the sorcerer as this kind of figure. They say that's no doubt what this figure is on the cave ceiling. Um, later, they say, his functions will be absorbed by agricultural societies. They will become the Kachinas of the Hopi or the Zuni or the Pueblos, for example, who still provide rain for crops. At festivals, elders will still impersonate the Kachinas in ways that remind us that in the Paleolithic, the shaman could take on the divine powers in part by donning an animal mask, just as in some ways the, a vested priest by putting on the vestments makes him stand in, at least for the duration of the service, allows him to stand in for God. This, this, this isn't the only way of understanding this figure. Right? As I said, it's still controversial. We still don't know quite what to do with it. Um, another really interesting uh, interpretation comes from Maria Gimbutas in a book called The Language of the Goddess. Uh, Gimbutas is really important because it was some of her earlier books which sort of kicked off the whole hypothesis of the great goddess that we talked about in our last lectures. She sees that the sorcerer is already a god, but for her, the Paleolithic imagination would have conceptualized the eternal, the cyclical, the self-renewing nature of the cosmos as female as the great goddess in ways that we have been talking about. For her then, the sorcerer is a representation of an individual existence in the form of a male who's always a temporary consort of the goddess. He's born from her, he grows up to mate with her, and then he dies to be replaced by sacred kings in ways that we've looked at. Demutsi, who becomes embodied in a succession of the kings of Uruk, and Osiris, who lives again in each new pharaoh, who is his son, Horus. The, the differences in these views are not finally irreconcilable. Um, Leeming and Page suggest that the shaman in earlier days becomes, after agriculture, the dying and rising god that Gimbutas already sees in the cave paintings. Scott Leonard and Michael McClure, in a book called Myth and Knowing, suggest that such later dying gods as Balder or Osiris or Demutsi or Adonis are really descendants of the sorcerer in the cave. They are born, they consummate a relationship with the goddess, they fall into death, and in the myths of the future, they will be resurrected or supplied with surrogates so that the seasonal cycle can go on. Um, as Leonard and, and McClure say it in their book about this aspect of, of, of the uh, sorcerer, vegetation protrudes from the soil in the spring, waxes in strength throughout the summer, ages and declines in autumn, and vanishes in a kind of death during the winter. 
Similarly, the dying gods gain in strength and influence, but are suddenly cut down in their prime, often su suffering dismemberment and the scattering of their remains, disappearing into the underworld, only to be reanimated in due course. Clyde Ford, in uh, his book, The Hero with an African Face, offers another kind of conciliating vision between all these many different ways of looking at the, at the, uh, at the sorcerer. He says that as long as the hunt is the principal means of survival, the goddess's body is the field of pursuit, and she has to provide an ever-renewing source of game. That's part of what the goddess does. She also has to make animal, her, her animal children available to hunters, but she also needs to make sure that those who are killed will be reborn, so that in really important ways, the hunter has to be a partner of the goddess. He has to be an agent of her will. He has to adapt himself to her rhythms. Ford illustrates this part of uh, his idea with a myth of the Yoruba people in West Africa. And the point of this myth is what happens if a goddess isn't served properly or if she's offended with the hunters who need her animals in order to survive. This, he tells, is the story of the red buffalo woman. In this story, the chief of the hunter is one night stays out all night on a fruitless hunt, Cat kills nothing. Um, he sleeps out in a platform high in a tree and early in the morning he sees a, a buffalo taking off its skin out of which emerges this very beautiful woman. The woman then wraps up the buffalo skin and puts it into a termite mound and, or an anthill and, and, and then she leaves. He goes to get her bundle, he digs it up and takes it with him and he hides it in his house. Then he goes to market and at market he finds that she's operating a booth. Um, he buys something from her but then pretends that he has left his money at home so he says she'll have to stop at his house on her way out of town and he'll pay her then. When she stops by he plies her with yams and wine until she falls asleep. When it becomes discreet, when no one will see her leaving the house, then she goes, she leaves, but of course when she gets back to her aunt, he'll discovers that her buffalo robe is gone, it's disappeared. She figures out what has happened and she goes back to the house and says, okay, what do you do with my buffalo robe? And he, he talks her into marrying him. She agrees to marry him, but only under two conditions. One, that he never tells his other wives where he found her, or two, never tells them what he took from her. The marriage, in a way, symbolizes a kind of rapport between a hunter and the regenerating power of the game he needs to survive. The chief hunter is now actually married to this cycle of predator and prey of life and death, the very skills that shamans and animal masters needed to be of use to their people. In this story, years pass and four children are born, but the other wives remain curious. Where did this woman come from? Why does no one ever come to visit her? Why doesn't she have any relatives? One night, um, they manage to get the chief hunter drunk enough that they, he tells them everything. He tells them the story of the, of the red buffalo woman. They tell it to her. They said, aha, now we know where you came from. What she does is she immediately gathers up her skin and puts it on. She kills the other three wives and then returns to the forest, leaving behind her a piece of horn that the children can use to call her when they need help. We can see in, in, a, in a myth like this how delicate the contract is between the shaman or animal master and the prey. The, anim, the buffalo woman's humanity shows up in her care for her children, but her commitment is absolute for the need, to the need for the chief hunter to adapt to her rhythms, and that requires that she kills the other three wives and then leaves. Um, those other three wives' lives were dependent in any case on the chief hunter's sensitivity to the cycles of the goddess and those animals that he relates to. For the Yoruba, the uh, horn that she leaves behind is always a way to call her, but they remember they have to play by her rules, the kind of rules that a shaman or an animal master spends his entire life learning. Well, that's a, a kind of su suggestion or at least a, a good guess at what God may have looked like to the Paleolithic people. What happens next overlaps with the history we talked about in the Goddess Lectures, the agricultural revolution, when people settled down and started living in different ways than they had ever lived before. When they did, and we've mentioned this before, there were new domestic arts that were needed, like pottery. There were new kinds of specialization needed. There were, and for each one of these, there had to be a new deity to oversee and sanction these new activities. And then finally, you needed a priesthood 
to preserve and interpret the myths and the rituals to make sure they were memorized and done correctly because this is very important. The uh, shamans of early, earlier days probably got incorporated into these new rituals. Um, in Native American cultures, for example, they become the dancing animal spirits of fertility rituals. As animals were domesticated and men and women became more aware of the participation of males in the fertility of females, Leeming and Page suggest that they must have learned sometimes killing an old bull to replace him with a younger and more virile one is a good idea. But based on centuries of experience and myths like that of the Cherokee bear man, that the slain animal also had to be respected and treated well enough that it could be reborn from the Mother Earth. So, they surmise, the priests, perhaps still dressed like the sorcerer, would have sung and danced over the bull as it died, performing all the right rituals to guarantee its revival. And this might be one of the ways in which the idea of a dying god comes to be, and it becomes, as we've mentioned before, one of the largest bodies of myth in the entire world. Um, one of the best places to study or find evidence for this stage of, of God's biography is from a place called Katul Hayek in Turkey. It was excavated about half a century ago, and it's an interesting place. The goddess presence is very strong here, but so is the male presence, and the male is most often symbolized here as a bull. In one statue, a woman seems to be giving birth and the shrine in which that appears has the entire, all of the walls are decorated with bulls. The male here is given a prominent place in what seems to be a mystery cult, but he is, or a fertility cult, sorry, but he is still subordinate to the goddess. We guess that, as in so many other stories, once he's fertilized the goddess, he dies. And if so, that points once again to that collection of myths and rituals gathered by Sir James Fraser in The Golden Bough, in which the king is sacrificed each year to make way for a younger rival to guarantee fertility for another year. We've already looked at some myths like this. Demutsi, as we saw in their myth, is both Inanna's son, his name actually means sacred son, is both her son and her fertilizing consort, who then dies. He's born from her, everything is born from her, and when, and when he, he grows up, then he plows her wet field, as she says, and then he dies back into her. Every spring he celebrates with her the sacred marriage, and then she decrees his sweet fate, involving the mystery of the death of the planted seed, growth, and then the mystery of death. And importantly, Demutsi isn't quite literally resurrected. As we saw in his story, he lives on in every king of Uruk who becomes Demutsi while he reigns. And of course, we've seen that same pattern in Isis and Osiris, which is at the very center of Egypt's myth mythology, where we have the mystery of the great mother and of the dying god. As we saw back in lecture 15, Isis is the throne on which the pharaoh sat. She was also the earth, flooded and fertilized each year by the rising and falling waters of her husband, Osiris. Osiris is also a dying god, so when the pharaoh dies, he becomes Osiris, and he is reborn in Horus, the son Isis conceives from her dead husband. Um, Leeming and Page actually suggest, and this is an interesting um, sort of sidebar to all of this, the two of the most important portraits of the Virgin Mary later on in history will be one holding the infant Christ in her arms. The other is the Pieta, in which she holds her dead son in her arms. And as they point out, this, those two images together capture both aspects of the goddess and the dying god. The images that Christians were going to use later are probably in part derived from Isis and, and Osiris, and that's appropriate because Jesus turns out to be one of the last in a long line of dying and resurrected gods. That was a bit of a sidebar. We've also seen the, the same uh, myth in Lecture 13 in the myth of Mwetsi from Zimbabwe, who dies and is replaced by a younger Mambo. And then each Mambo from then on is an incarnation of Mwetsi. And in Lecture 12, we saw that in Norse mythology, every good king is considered an incarnation of Frere, the vegetation god who also dies, but, it is, but is resurrected in every good ruler, who then ceremonially, ceremonially marries the goddess. We have a very explicit uh, version of the dying god myth from, the, uh, from Ugarit in uh, northern Syria. In it, the fertility god Baal fights a long battle with Yam, a kind of water monster, a little like Tiamat, except that in this case he's male. 
Um, when he wins, uh, he becomes the king of the gods, just as Marduk did uh, when he defeated his sea monster in his story. There's a lot of plot in this story involving uh, the, his sister Anat and the building of a new palace. One little detail that always jumps out at me is that when, when the, the, his new palace is, as they have a housewarming party, two earthly kings are invited to the party. And when the kings arrive, they are described as the two who suckle at the breast. We've seen that you know, the pharaohs are those who suckle at the breast of Isis, and so clearly there's some comparable kind of idea um, here that the, the kings are those who suckle at the breast of the great goddess. Anyway, Baal is eventually challenged by Mat, the lord of the underworld, and like Inanna, he somehow manages to get down into the underworld, and w while he's there, he winds up really essentially dead. He is defeated by Mat. Um, and when he dies, the earth goes into mourning, and when the earth goes into mourning, everything becomes sterile, plants stop growing, um, and it looks as though chaos is about to descend again. Um, but Anat, Baal's sister, this time travels to the land of the dead. She fights with and kills Mot, and then she cuts Mot up into little pieces and buries him in the ground. Um, Mot had, by that time, already swallowed Baal, so that the planting of Mot leads to the resurrection both of Mot and of Baal himself, so that the battle can go on, the battle between life and death, between fertility and sterility. This myth uh, is similar to ones we've seen in the past, but it's adapted to the climate and meteorological conditions of Canaan, which tended to run in cycles. You had years of plenty followed by years of drought and scarcity. So when Mott defeats Baal and confines him in the underworld, you get a bad series of years. When Anat kills and plants Mott, Baal is restored and years of plenty follow. As uh, Cyrus Gordon in an article about uh, Canaanite mythology says about this myth, he says, the aim of the Baal-Anat cult was always to secure the victory of Baal over Mott to usher in a seven-year cycle of plenty so that the populace may enjoy the blessings of abundance. Our last story of a uh, dying uh, god is from the Ojibwe people of North America. Um, and in this story, there's a young man who is, reaches the age when he has to go on his vision quest. This is the time that marks the transition from childhood to, to, to grown up. And so when he, and he goes on his vision quest to have the spirit come to tell him what his new identity is and what his new role in life will be, his father builds him a lodge way out in the wilderness where he can go and fast and wait for the visitation from the spirit. It's springtime as they're going out to build this lodge, and the young man notices burgeoning life all around him, and he thinks to himself how wonderful it would be to know more about plants to make our people less dependent on the hunt or on fishing. Um, after three days of fasting, a, a figure does descend, being, having been sent by the Great Spirit, in, answers to the boy's un, in answer to the boy's unusual wish. The boy, you know, the, the Spirit says, your un wish was very unusual. Most young boys coming out here want to be great warriors. You wanted rather to help your people. And so he said, that's what I'm here to do. But he said, in order to get to this, you have to wrestle me. Well, the boy has been fasting for three days, he's weak, but he wrestles as heroically as he can, and after a while the spirit says, that's enough for today. The spirit says, I'll come back tomorrow and we'll do it again, and he does, then he goes back the third day, and each day the boy wrestles with him very heroically, despite the fact that by now the boy is really getting weak from all the wrestling and from all of the, uh, all of the fasting. On the last day, um, the, the spirit says to the boy's name, the boy's name is Once, by the way, the, the spirit says to Once, I'll come back one more day and this time you will defeat me. When you defeat me, you will kill me and when you kill me, I want you to bury me in the plot of ground I will show you and then keep that plot of ground free of weeds. He does, he does exactly what he's been told to do and by summer's end, there's a long, graceful plant that has sprung up out of the ground with clusters of yellow at the sides, with long green leaves and a plume at the top, looking ex remarkably like the figure who wrestled and was buried there. The boy then gets his father and tells him that if people will care for his friend in the way that he had been told, they wouldn't be so dependent anymore on hunting and fishing for survival. He shows his father how to take off the yellow clusters, how to brown them in the fire. The family has a feast, and from then on, the people have the gift of corn or maize. 
Uh, there are lots of other stories like this that we could do, just to mention a couple of them in passing. The Mandi people of Mali have a story of Pharaoh who dies to atone for his brother's defilement of their mother and from whose dismembered body trees emerge. The Australians have a story of a rain god who sinks into the ground and dies, leaving behind child seeds, which will later on plant themselves in mother's wombs. Uh, a devotee of this cult comes to this place and waits for a dream vision of a certain seed, and then he dreams again, encouraging that seed to enter his wife's womb. After each lifetime, that seed returns to wait for its next birth in human form. The Greeks have a myth of Dionysus, torn apart and then resurrected in the spring, about the time of the annual Athenian drama festival held in his honor. Quetzalcoatl of the Aztecs dies to revive humanity, and there's all, there are also the myths of Sibyl and uh, Attis and Adonis and Aphrodite and many, many others. The point is that this is who God or the gods become about the time of the agricultural revolution. They are more important than in earlier days, but they are still subordinate to a goddess who is still the source of life and vitality. This is, as we said, is probably based in part on historical circumstances, but it's probably based on biological ones as well. The biology uh, at, the, at the basis for this dying god idea is as explicated by, by uh, Leonard McClure. The male's life-giving seed energizes and organizes the life potential of the womb and the soil. The myth logic behind this category is that the life force resting within the earthen and female body cannot be activated without the father's power to give it shape and direction. Unlike many of their female counterparts, however, father gods often do not remain intimate with their offspring. In human relationships, the father becomes irrelevant after the sexual act. The children his seed calls forth are formed within the body of another, a deep connection that fathers cannot experience or duplicate. Um, this is partly what that Abyssinian woman that we quoted um, in, the, uh, in the last lecture meant by the difference between giving birth and making. It'll be a while before that bond is challenged in mythology. But at, by this time, we are beyond the Paleolithic world in time. Um, we have reached uh, the agricultural revolution, and we have reached a place um, in our history, our biography of God, which, again, to, to quote Lemming and Page, puts it, put, they put it this way. The wildness, the magic, the promiscuity of God and his mask as old shaman trickster have been transformed by the dying god of the Neolithic period into the controlled and relatively orderly processes, practices of domesticated procreation, agriculture, and animal husbandry. As the wild berries and grasses, the wild animals, and the great mother herself have been contained in the village walls, so has God. Those are snapshots, just some snapshots. And, and again, we're, we're largely on speculative ground here. We're having to make a lot out of what evidence is available. But if we're right, if we're even on the right track, these would give us a series of snapshots of what God might have looked like from the Paleolithic into the Neolithic and then into the time of the agricultural revolution. Next time, um, we will look at the next stages in our biography of God or the gods as we look particularly at myths about Father Sky and Mother Earth. And then we'll do some myths showing the way the male sky gods usurp the authority of the goddess. We'll be looking at it from the male point of view rather than the female point of view, which we did um, in our last lectures. And taking away this authority of the goddess that she may have held at this point for at least 25,000 years.